Okay, I think we're going to get started. Um, uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Reynolds Company's uh, user group some online seminar today. Our focus will be on condition monitoring and an overview of the Dynamics 1444 product. And uh, today, our presenter will be Brianne Murray. Brianne uh, works for Rockwell Automation in Houston, and she is a solution consultant with a focus on information and analytics. And my name is David Newt. I'm also a panelist. I'll be doing this, the brief introduction. And I am an automation specialist uh, for the Reynolds Company out of Houston. And we do have a few other folks that are backing us up uh, in case we get questions in the chat. So as you, as you can see, uh, we just have a couple of remaining online events for the calendar year. And today happens to be our final user group of the year. So it's been quite a year, 2020. Um, and uh, as we, when we started the year, we were not really doing it quite this way, but here we are, and we made it through to the last user group. Um, and we also have uh, two tech talks left for the year. Um, the next one will be uh, next Wednesday on October 28th, and we will be discussing uh, the, a visualization update with a focus on Rockwell's new uh, VersaView 6300 line. And we're excited about this line. Uh, it's, we feel it's gonna bring us into some new markets, uh, new, new for Rockwell, where we haven't, where Rockwell really hasn't had a product offering yet. Uh, so we're broadening the, the Rockwell footprint with uh, respect to visualization hardware. So please tune in for that one. And then uh, in a few weeks, we'll have our final tech talk, which will be a preview of Rockwell's automation fair at home. And so be sure to tune into that uh, as we will go over some of the details and of what to expect from the automation fair. So with that uh, quick, a quick introduction to the automation fair. So it's coming up in uh, about a month, November 16th through 20th. It's five days this year and it's at home. So it's uh, so please register. The registration has been open for for, for several weeks, um, and uh, the registration is is free. Uh, there are um, hands-on labs that are that that do that do require a fee, and I don't know if those are still available or not. They they fill up pretty quickly. So uh, so please uh, go and register if you haven't already to the automation fair at home. And one quick note, if uh, for those of you that have been to the uh, process user group in the past, or what we call PSUG, that, that is also ongoing. And what Rockwell has done is sort of incorporated the process solution user group sort of inside the automation fair, where in previous years, the uh, solution group has always occurred before automation fair, and it's kind of been a sort of a different event at the same location. This year, it's all kind of combined into one large event. So please register if you haven't already. And with that, I will give you Brianne or Bree Murray and uh, go ahead, Bree, take it over. Thank you. Yeah, we'll do. Dave, I am going to request control here. Okay, um, and I'm gonna approve. Awesome. So, hey everybody, uh, David already gave me a, a quick intro, but just a refresher, I am what we call an information and analytics solution consultant at Rockwell. And so that's a, a long title for what essentially means um, supporting our customers, you guys, um, and our distributors and our sales teams, specifically in the realm of software and other analytics products. And um, I think the Dynamics 1444 series fits pretty well on the device level in that space. So I wanted to start our conversation I don't know what I did, David. <laughs> Let's see here. There we go. Um, I wanted to start our conversation with a, a quick overview of integrated condition monitoring, just to give everybody a refresher 
Uh, if you guys spend a lot of time with vibration, this would be a little bit of a review for you, but I think it's a good way to start everybody out on a level playing field, make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, and then I'll dive into the specifics around the Dynamics 1444 series. Um, afterwards, I'll talk a bit about how that system fits pretty well into our integrated architecture that Rockwell is pretty infamous for. Um, and then I'll do a quick overview of our condition monitoring software, um, the other pieces of the vibration monitoring portfolio. And then lastly, a really quick, um, review of a, a pretty popular competitive analysis that we get asked on often. Um, let's see here. All right, David, I think I might have to just have you do the slides for me. David, will you, will you grab control and present for me again? Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, no did worries. you see the presentation? I do, I do. Okay. There we go. Um, so I wanted to start our conversation with a, a quick reference to analytics. And I like to use this diagram because I think it gives pretty good insight into the concept of, of scalable analytics. And, and I think the reality is that lately we've been seeing a lot of pushes towards analytics investments and digital transformation initiatives across the board. But I think a lot of folks get pretty distracted with the assumption that analytics always means big data or in-depth machine learning. Um, and it does mean those things, but I think it's really important to remember that you can start small with analytics and start small with, with making sure our devices are intelligent and intuitive. Um, and scalable analytics doesn't just mean scaling from the device level up to the system and plant level and then to the enterprise level, but it also scales in maturity. Um, starting from descriptive into diagnostic and predictive and prescriptive analytics as well. But with any initiative or desire to implement analytics in a plan, I think it's, it's pretty vital that we make sure, again, that we start um, our systems at the device level, make sure our machines and our equipment are intelligent before diving deeper uh, into trying to have successful analytics from a higher level, like the enterprise level, for example. Um, so we're the dynamic system fits in is um, is at that device level. And, and Dave, you can go ahead and, and click through the next couple. Um, but what's nice about condition monitoring is it not it's not just at that descriptive level. It does sit there and it tells you whether or not vibration is, is too high. Um, and it tells you a little bit about why specific faults are happening, but it also starts getting into the predictive and prescriptive phases as well by predicting when and how faults are propagating and starting to take action based on that information as well. Um, but go ahead and hop into the next slide, David. Um, and we can dig into what condition monitoring is from a high level perspective. And um, from a definition standpoint, condition monitoring is all about taking a closer look into key parameters, understanding how they change and propagate over time and understanding how that can impact the performance and the health of the machine. Um, and condition monitoring in general can look at a couple different things. It could be temperature, it could be vibration, it could be any number of things, but we're going to focus on vibration today. Um, and this type of vibration condition monitoring is a value for several reasons. Um, first, understanding vibration on rotating equipment is going to help protect from damage. Um, it's going to help us identify issues before they occur. It'll help pinpoint issues before they're impacting quality of what we're producing. Um, and it's also going to help get into that predictive space by, by reducing maintenance costs and understanding how we can optimize repair schedules based on our understanding of, of how faults and vibrations are growing or propagating over time. Now, all of these values, again, are, are maturing from that descriptive place in analytics into predictive analytics, um, which, which falls really well in line with what we call predictive maintenance strategies. Um, and we can have a really robust predictive maintenance strategy by consistent management of those fault indicators. Um, so on the next slide, we'll go ahead and talk a little bit more about what fault indicators are. 
And faults are, are repetitive impacts that are occurring at specific and identifiable, identifiable frequencies when it comes to vibrations. Now, these are specific and identifiable because of the mechanical and electrical attributes of a machine or piece of equipment. But they're also identifiable because they're most often multiples of the running speed of a machine. So if we've got an intimate knowledge of how quickly a machine's running uh, and the pieces and parts that make up a piece of equipment or a line, we can start capturing vibration frequencies, doing some reverse engineering, and then pinpointing the specific attributes or components that are creating faults and gonna potentially have a big impact um, to do damage in the future. So there's a little bit of, of physics and engineering that goes into that reverse engineering analysis process. Uh, so if we hop to the next slide, um, the way that we break down those vibration signals into specific frequencies and fault indicators, this is all done through a mathematical analysis that we call the fast Fourier transform, also known as, as FFT. Um, and any mechanical engineers out there, you guys are probably pretty familiar with this concept, but an FFT analysis converts signals from a time domain, um, so our overall time waveform, into um, a diagram or a, a system that's now looking at amplitude on a frequency domain. And so if you look at those plots there uh, in, in this diagram, we're looking at a complex time waveform, and that time waveform is made up of a variety of different um, sinusoidal waves that occur at different frequencies. So that's that, that broken down three-dimensional plot you see in the back there. Now, if we were to essentially rotate, and instead of looking at that from the front, look at it from the side, that's what the FFT is doing. It's breaking it down into each of those signals so that now we can view it and understand it from different peaks that we might see at different frequencies. The smallest frequencies being at the far right, the bigger frequencies that could refer to something uh, like an imbalance or something that's happening once per revolution or every couple revolutions um, at the far left. But the ability to break this down and now understand this information from a frequency perspective is that reverse engineering piece of it, right? It's what's giving us insight and helping us understand um, at which frequencies are important things happening. And now we can start associating, okay, well, based on my understanding of the machine um, and the fact that I'm seeing something at this frequency, I can deduce that it's associated with a bearing defect, an imbalance, um, a gear defect, whatever it could be, pump cavitation, so on and so forth. Now, if we're looking at just what the, the frequencies and their amplitudes are, we're sitting between the descriptive and the diagnostic analytic spaces. And David, if you could jump to the next slide there um, and go ahead and hit the, the button twice, I think. Um, so what we're doing right there with just understanding where those frequencies are at is understanding that descriptive and diagnostic piece. We know how we're running and we know what's behind those faults. But what's nice about a condition monitoring system is it also allows you to expand beyond that into the predictive space, right? So now we're gonna start digging into understanding how things are, are changing over time. So if you hop into the next slide, um, this is how we're gonna do that. So not only is a condition monitoring system gonna give you insight into what's causing the fault, but it's helping you set thresholds to monitor a fault and understanding how it's evolving over time. Because um, the reality is, almost all faults propagate exponentially until failure. So if we can understand and, and set up in, in a system when a fault passes detection, meaning it's, it's higher than normal, but it's not necessarily going to immediately cause damage or a huge problem, and then understand at what rate it's moving or could cross a threshold into an alarm level, um, now we've got insight not into what's just causing the occult or how high it is, but when action needs to be taken. So again, that's, that's evolving into that predictive maintenance piece, which is really valuable and really important, especially if we wanna start saving costs and be acting and behaving from a, a, a predictive maintenance schedule instead of a reactive maintenance schedule or something similar. Now, if you hop one more slide, David, um, what sets Rockwell's vibration condition monitoring solution apart is specifically how it fits into our, our infamous integrated architecture, right? So vibration amplitude condition data directly ties into tags in logics. Um, and not only are you gonna see the amplitude in, in the value section of those, that Studio 5000 system there, but you're also able to see the frequency bands and then you can have associated descriptions of each of these there as well. Um, so the ability to, to fit quickly and easily into a controller uh, and then create your own logic depending on how you need the machine to respond is really valuable and really important. Now, 
you want to hop one more slide, David? Um, that was our intro into the, the concepts and kind of the science behind condition monitoring. But now I want to go ahead and dive into the details of the product. Uh, so if you hop forward one, this is our 1444 dynamic system. Um, it's our on-machine condition monitoring solution uh, for rotating equipment. And it's a system with a pretty simple distributed architecture. The bulk of the computations and measurement is done within the large module that you see on the far left there. Um, this piece is what we call the dynamic measurement module. But the 1444 system also has three expansion modules, which are the three on the right, that make it a pretty flexible solution uh, should you have a particularly unique application. Um, but because it fits into our integrated architecture system, again, not only are we going to have tags tied directly there, but that's how the system is configured. Um, the system itself can continue to communicate with the controller over Ethernet, but it's also capable of independent function should you really want it to be a, a true standalone device sitting at the machine level. Um, now, if you hop forward one slide for me, David, um, I want to talk a little bit about the hardware of the system. But the 1444 has, has two Ethernet ports um, that are going to allow the unit to work under star, linear, daisy chain, or device-level ring topologies. Um, the main module and the tachometer module have integrated buffered output BNC connectors. Those are the, the round ones you see on the bottom there. Um, the entire unit is then rear mounted. Um, each module has a terminal base, so that's what you see on the back end. Each terminal base has its own connections, um, and those are going to be for non-sensitive wiring and power, whereas if you look at the innermost connectors um, on either side of the, the 1444 modules there, those are going to be for sensitive signals that might need higher reliability. Um, for all of those connectors, we've got removable plug connectors of a couple different options that can help simplify wiring as well. Um, now hop forward one for me, David. Uh, and we're going to hone in a little bit on the dynamic measurement module. So again, that was the, the wider one on the far left there. But this is the main module of the 1444 system that's doing all of the, the computation and is hosting a lot of the functionality in one compact system. Um, it's got two processors and non-volatile memory that will retain its configuration and event log should it lose connection or power and have to restart. Um, it takes four dynamic inputs per module, meaning if you had four different accelerometers, you could do that. If you wanted more, you could daisy chain two together. Uh, it also takes two TTL speed inputs but alternatively, it could reference speed from a controller if it was connected. And again, that speed is important because faults are almost always a multiple of the running speed of a machine. Now, in this module, we've also got four buffered outputs, two Ethernet ports, as I mentioned on the last slide, um, but also one SBDT relay that can be assigned to any alarm or fault to, make, to take immediate action um, if desired. Now, if you have one more slide for me, um, you know, I mentioned that we've got three different expansion modules, and I want to talk about each of those now. Uh, the first is our tachometer signal conditioning expansion module on the, the top right there. Um, essentially what it does is it can take two speed inputs from any current probes or magnetic pickups or similar, and it'll output those inputs into TTL signals as outputs um, to be extended to the host main module that you see on the top left. Um, you can have one of these per main module, but one tachometer signal conditioning module could support and send signals to up to six dynamic measurement modules. We've also got a 4 to 20 milliamp output expansion module. It's got four channels, and you can have one of these per main module. And then lastly, on the, on the bottom in the middle there, uh, we've got a relay expansion module that can add a total of four SPDT relays in addition to the one that's included in the main module. Um, now, what's nice about this system is you can have up to three of these expansion relay modules associated with one ma main module, which would give you a total of 13 additional relays um, or 13 total relays should you have an application that requires that. Um, the last piece that I think is, is worth considering and mentioning here, in the bottom right, you see our, our terminal bases. Um, the wider dynamic measurement module has its own terminal base, but each of the three expansion modules share a common terminal base. And I'll talk a little bit about those in the next slide, if you want to hop one forward for me. Um, these, these terminal bases are, are hosting the local bus and providing communications and power distribution between the host and expansion modules. Um, they also are what's distributing the tachometer speed signals um, across several different uh, dynamic measurement modules should the application require it. 
Um, so they're all connected via ribbon cable between each. So those are the, the, the orange symbols that you see there uh, in that diagram. But from an architecture perspective, a main module could host up to five expansion modules. Um, and so that would be one tachometer, three relay, and one analog module. Um, and again, the, the host module is going to power, manage, and configure each of its associated expansion modules. Um, and they're typically going to be mounted directly to the right of the host. Um, now, from a hardware perspective, the last thing I wanted to mention was a few of the certifications and specifications of the system. So if you go one slide forward for me, um, I think this is valuable because we've talked about this being a, an on-machine solution, right? Um, and if we want it to sit on the machine, we need it to be a little bit more rugged. Um, so I won't read all of these off to you guys, but I think it's worth mentioning, especially calling particular attention to the class one div two certification, but it's a rugged system. It's meant to be on the machine and it, and it can handle it pretty well. Um, so if you go one slide forward for me, um, I've mentioned this a bit briefly on some of the other slides, but I wanted to make sure that we spent some time uh, talking a little bit more about how the system fits specifically into Rockwell's integrated architecture portfolio. Um, and so one more slide for me, David. Um, what I think is particularly valuable about the 1444 system is again, its ability to seamlessly integrate and, and translate its information into tags in a logix controller. And not only are those tags, again, displaying just the amplitude of a false vibration, but they're categorized and split up by frequency and frequency bands, which helps give insight into the specific attribute or component that's causing the vibration. But what's nice too is you don't have to go in and remember um, exactly what's gonna be associated with channel zero SFT band one or channel zero order zero magnitude. Um, when you do the setup of the system, you have the ability to um, inherently put in different descriptions for each of those frequency bands. So that now, whenever you were to go in and look at your tags or associate them within your visualization platform, whatever it might be, you have the information about what specifically is ca causing that. So bearing wear, uh, unbalanced, whatever it might be. Now, um, logic data, again, this is probably pretty commonly known to most of you, but it integrates itself seamlessly into our visualization platforms, um, which drives the concept of a, a truly integrated architecture homing even further. So, now, with all of your information saved as tags, um, you can see that information directly on any of your screens. It can be color coded based on the detection or alarm thresholds that you might have set. Uh, you could go in and put that information in Trend Pro and see how it's changing over time. Um, but having access to not just important data, but data that's intuitive and actionable is, is a really big step in the right direction. Um, so go one more slide for me, David. Um, and I think also worth mentioning that the 1444 system is supported by any logics controller. Um, it could be control logics, compact logics, or guide logics. Uh, it only requires version 20 or greater, uh, or version 24 if you're looking for a redundant system. Uh, and then in addition, again, to those intuitive tag data that's directly connected with the system, um, the configuration of the modules is what's done within the Studio 5000 system. So I think I mentioned before that it can run standalone without being directly connected to the controller if desired. All you would essentially need a controller for is just the initial configuration, and then it can operate alone if you like. Um, so hop one more slide for me, David. The last thing that I thought worth mentioning as far as integrated architecture goes is, is showing off a little bit how it fits into our, our network strategy. But the 1444 series is a big part of our, our CPWE, Converge Plant Wide Ethernet strategy. Um, it supports, again, device level ring, star, and daisy chain topologies. Uh, which gives you a lot of flexibility depending on, on where you want to implement it in the network that may already be there. Um, but also the ability to, to actively access and, and configure this system across a variety of topologies and, and control systems hits home again that, that seamless integration and that integrated architecture system. Um, and one more slide, I, I want to show you guys a couple of, just a slide that'll give a, a little bit of an example of the different architectures there. Because I've mentioned several times now, it can do DLR, it can do daisy chain, it can do star topology. But what I really like about this slide is it gives you a little bit of context into the ability to modularly um, expand or change how the 1444 system works with uh, either additional main modules or additional expansion modules. Um, so depending on what the application required, if you needed a certain number of accelerometers mounted to really get the full context of the machine, 
um, if you needed that tachometer speed module or if you wanted the additional relays to start performing its own logic at the site. There's a lot of flexibility in how you can do that um, with these modules alone. So worth mentioning, just wanted to show that to you guys and give you guys a little bit of concept, content um, and context to how that can look like um, within your system. Uh, but one more slide for me, David. And before I hop forward, again, the last thing I want to mention is our condition monitoring software. Um, but in addition to that, I'm also going to talk a little bit about the other pieces of um, the vibration monitoring portfolio, so some of our handhelds and sensors. Uh, and then the final thing that I'll go over is just a really quick competitive analysis for you guys. Um, so go on forward for me. And <clears throat> excuse me. The focus again today was around our 1444 system, but I think it's important to mention that we do have a specific condition monitoring software that adds additional functionality if you want to pinpoint and add insight into vibration uh, concerns. And this is called eMonitor, but we put particular emphasis on this software whenever there's a desire to expand beyond vibration condition data that would be held in Logix tags or Logix alarms. Um, if you wanted or needed a closer look uh, into direct time waveforms or spectrum analyses, this is what the software would, would be a good uh, thing to handle. Now, with any monitor, you've got a huge variety of visualization options, whether it be time waveform plots, spectrum waterfall plots, diagrams that are gonna show you those, uh, those frequency diagrams, but specifically, it'll associate the um, threshold levels that you've assigned as far as alarming and detection goes. Um, and over 20 other, I think, pre-configured options. Um, this would be really good if you had a vibration expert or somebody that was devoted to looking at and understanding this for critical machinery. Um, they'd be able to dig into the detail and start making their own decisions based on the vibration information that they uncover here, in addition to what's um, inherently included in, within the control system. Now, again, the 1444 system can run standalone, but if your application requires that deeper dive, uh, this is when we would recommend eMonitor as a way to access and leverage that information. Um, but you can go ahead and flip to the next slide, David, but I think it's also worth mentioning too that eMonitor um, works with our, our Dynamics 2500 portables. And you know the focus today was on the 1444 system, but I think it's important that we, we make sure we at least uh, take note of all of the other systems that exist and that we've used, especially historically in the past. But our 2500 portables are one of those. Uh, we've also got a, a pretty decent suite of sensors that would connect, um, and it's the, I guess, the bottom end of, of the vibration sensor system, excuse me. But what I think is, is worth mentioning too is with that suite of sensors, the nice part about the 1444 system is if you're doing it for the first time and you don't have any accelerometers set up already, um, we've got them for you. TRC, they, those guys can help you get the right ones set up and ready to go. But what's nice is, let's say you've already had a vibration system, you've already got some leftover accelerometers that are mounted on a machine. The 1444 system plays really nicely with um, most third-party accelerometers and sensors as well. So nothing of huge concern, but I thought worth mentioning. And if you have one more slide for me, David, this is the last thing I wanted to talk about today. Um, but I wanted to do a quick competitive analysis. And I think, at least from my perspective, perspective, I've seen and fielded a lot of questions specifically around how the 1444 system compares to its Bentley Nevada counterparts. Um, and historically, the, the comparison has always been centered around Bentley Nevada's 3500 series. So that's, that's what I was going to focus on before I let you all go today. Um, but the Bentley Nevada system is a very capable one, but it also comes at a, a financial, a spatial, and a scalable cost. So while the 1444 system is an on-machine, DIN rail mounted device. Um, Bentley Nevada series is a 19 inch rack based system, which has to be installed in a controlled environment. And because of those environment restrictions, it typically requires pretty substantial costs when it comes to cable installation, especially if you don't have um, nearby access to that, that controlled room, right? Now, the 3500 series also requires nine modules uh, which are going to be what it takes to do all of the functions of one main 1444 dynamic measurement module. Um, and it also requires uh, a GE System 1 installation if you wanted to dig into complex data like fast Fourier transforms, time waveforms, or similar. Um, 
whereas these calculations are inherently done within the 1444 system. And should you want a more granular visualization, again, we can help you implement that e-monitor system, uh, which would be a, a pretty significant cost savings when you compare it to a, a GE system one. But anyways, uh, that's something we get quite a few questions about um, as far as comparisons go. So I thought worth touching on here. Uh, it's important to note that because each application is different, uh, different systems have different different pros, different cons, but the 1444 system really excels in its modularity, its flexibility, and the ability to be implemented, um, again, on the machine, close to the machine. So that's what I had for today. Um, David, you can hop to the next slide. Hopefully this was helpful for everybody. I know it was a, a pretty quick monologue and an overview of the 1444 series. Um, again, for me, as an information and analytics solution consultant at Rockwell, um, with the stuff that I work on, I personally believe vibration condition monitoring is something that's often looked over, um, but really, really important and a valuable opportunity to start focus on making machines more intelligent and, and stepping into that analytics space. Um, but I'll pause here. David, Wayne, anybody else, if y'all have anything to add, feel free. Um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to shoot them in the chat and we'll be happy to, to try and answer them for you. But Otherwise, I'll, I'll let you guys go early, and uh, happy Thursday. Well, thank you very much, Bree. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat in the moment. Um, and I'd just like to, to thank everyone uh, for uh, tuning in today. And also, uh, just thank you for, uh, for this year, tuning in in general for our, all of our other content that we've offered this year. And uh, have a great rest of the year.